Okay, there's so many cameras <laughs> rolling, I'm not, I'm not sure which one I'm looking at. But we are at the Bunker Studios in uh, Bermondsey with two gentlemen who are responsible for creating one of the finest records in British rock history. This is Stephen Street and Mr. Graham Coxon. So we've got some great, we've got a lot of guitars here, we've got these two guys, we've got lots of cameras rolling, the tape is rolling on Graham's amplifier. So we're just going to talk about, I think we're going to talk about the Blur record, Blur Blur, it's 20 years of that record. And so it's got some unbelievably awesome riffs on it. You recorded it in a studio, well, a couple of studios across the world. I'd love to just to hear your memories of it, you know, recording those songs, you know, how they came about. And it's famously, we mentioned it before, Graham, it's, people often call it your album because it's mm. super guitar heavy, there's lots of uh, Chinese bombs is on there, you know, you know, song two and kind of loads of really abrasive guitar. Yeah, Damon was a good enabler for my, to, for me to become uh, noisy yeah. at times. I think he used to write these short, fast things, especially for me to go berserk. <laughs> Is a sort of a reward. Have <laughs> yeah, that one. Yeah, <laughs> one go mad. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure it's that guitar heavy. I'm not sure. Uh, we we were going in to make um, a record. Obviously, we over time our own musical tastes were diverging quite a lot. I was pretty heftily getting into. Um, I suppose I was coming a little bit out of my fast and noisy American punk thing, although I found the musicianship and, and the imagination and the playing um, just just really interesting and inspiring. But um, I was getting into what did I bring in? A lot looser sort of a lot looser stuff, maybe even what was called lo-fi at that point, which I've never liked that that. That, yeah, that term, that particularly, tech. I don't think it really exists. Um, <clears throat> so there was a bit of slanted and enchanted by pavement. I think I brought in um, one foot in the grave, uh, Beck album. I was going to say um, Lo-Fi Beck. Would you yeah, call him Lo-Fi? Do you think he's like the pi not pioneer, but well, the first, the first, the first record is was... quite Lo-Fi. But yeah. I mean, it was very clever musically, though. Yeah. And the thing was, is that I think at this phase, we all knew we wanted to do something different. I mean, I was just relieved that I wasn't one of the things that was being changed. So I was like, well, at least cause, <laughs> because there was a certain sense that there was a chapter come to an end when we'd finished, you know, the, the previous record, The Great Escape. And there was a certain sense of like, something's got to change. The next record's going to have to be different. So there was that willing to go, there was a desire to do something different mm. anyway. And when da Damon first played me the demos of the songs... Uh, that he kind of started to prepare for the record. And I just remember going for a drive, and he, which is the first time ever he actually had ever done this. He actually played me something on a cassette, you know, some ideas. And it struck me that the songs were different. They were very much more, they weren't any kind of character songs, they were very much sure. more yeah, yeah. inward looking, you know? Yeah. And I think to kind of reflect that inward looking, we had to kind of change the way we approached it. And. Um, and so to bring my tuppence to worth to it, I kind of invested in this new kind of recording system. It's called Radar. Oh, which yeah, was yeah, kind yeah. of out at the time, which was the first kind of hard drive kind yeah. of... Pro Tools, Pro Tools was around then, but it, it was days, too much yeah. looking at a, a screen with a mouse from my liking. I didn't want anything to do with that at all. Whereas Radar, it felt like a tape machine. You, had, you know, 1 to 20... Well, I actually only had 16 tracks of it. So 1 to 16, and like those old remotes for your tape machine, and you patched in... And I was able to let the book, the guys just play, mm. and that was really wonderful because I could always come back and edit it up later. Whereas before, in the old days, we had this bit of tape, and we had to fit so many songs on that bit of tape. Yeah. So I, you know, put the code down and then put the click track, the tempo, and everything, you know, for each song. And and if it wasn't right, we'd go back over it again because we were, you know, worried about using up too much tape. Yeah. So you have to kind of. Whereas this was like a certain sense of freedom, just letting them, you know jam and kind of mm. go for it which is something they continued on when they did 13 as well yeah. so yeah. it was good to have that you know when you mentioned jamming there i think we, we mentioned this before as well when you when you blur as a band come into the studio how formed are those songs i mean is it like well here's like a chord sequence and it's this kind of feel do you go and play them and create the songs or 
did Damon or you have a definite idea and you kind of just tell the guys this is how it's going to go, you know, how much was like... Well, you had done some of this, you hadn't you, Greg? Like, did you do pre-production, does Blur do pre-production? It was like a little bit, because I remember yeah. the photo, and the, if you look at the cover, there's a photo yeah. of the guys in the studio, yeah. that's, not actually, that's not actually us recording, ah. that is them kind of beginning to run through some ideas, but right. not, not a huge amount though, it, the, that whole point here was to leave the, the parameters open, you know what mm. I mean, it wasn't like in the past... The guys have to kind of demo their songs and get the okay from food to go in and record those songs properly now. Sure. Whereas this time there was none of that at all. No. It was like the first time those songs were recorded are what you hear on the album. Yeah. That's it. That's true, isn't it? Greg? Yeah, I, th I think we, I think as time went on, the less and less we wanted to. Obviously, earlier on, those songs were all rehearsed because hmm. we rehearsed them to gig. Uh, yeah, of and course. And then we yeah. just recorded yeah. them. As as they were, um, obviously there was a few reshuffles um, structurally, really, when we came to record it, probably from Stephen's input mm. or something. But um, that became less and less, and we wanted, to, I guess we wanted, we got looser and looser and looser as the 90s got towards the end, until it was so loose that, um, mm. we didn't know. Uh, do you think that, were you in that kind of enviable position where you'd sold loads of records, you were a kind of, you know, you'd... you'd Super, kind of fulfilled any desire of any record label. Did that give you the, the kind of, the green light to go and spread out a bit? Or was it, were you kind of? It think, did, didn't it? You it were did. getting less hassle, weren't you? Yeah. Did the A and R guys come in a bit less frequently? And yeah, yeah. I mean, we were free to do what we wanted to do, as it yeah. were. And and as I say, this sense also that. That because the guys actually hadn't recorded their songs before and demoed them, there was none of this pressure, so it's not like that on the demo. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I do think sometimes when you record a song for the very first time, a little bit of magic happens. Of and every time you yeah. re-record it, yeah. a little bit of that magic kind of disappears. Yeah. Um, I certainly felt like we were just able to kind of like, we proved ourselves to the grown-ups, as it were. Sure. You know what I mean? Uh, we know what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, let, us, let us just kind of crack on with it. I mean, because... You know, the band had gone through a very, very tiring phase of touring and everything and, you know, constantly been on the road. So that really, I was very aware of the fact that I wanted to make it as, as easy for them as possible, less pressure, because there'd been a couple of breaking points in the months building up to the album. And so I was really kind of keen to make sure that everyone was happy to have their own space and everyone was, you know what I mean, everyone was happy yeah. with the way that it was proceeding. So that's where I felt the pressure. Yeah. I felt the pressure wanting to make every single person in the band mm. happy. With the way it was, it was going, I didn't really care about what EMI yeah. thought. I, mean, I as was a caring more about what they felt as a band and musicians. As a producer, I mean, I think a lot of people don't really understand what producers really do. And I think what you just said there, you, you obviously work with the guys, but you know, yeah. Part Life and then Great Escape. Was, I mean, your does your role as a producer with Blur was a lot of it. A lot like of you said, making sure that the band keeps together. Really. Yeah, it is. It's not all just knob twiddling no. and, and and like you know being geeky. Yeah, uh, it really is, and especially more on that album than any previous album. I think it was a case of um, man management, you know, and making sure everyone is happy with the way things are going and and that their input is being listened to, mm. and uh, and that was important. And I think we got it right, and that's why I think that album is such a strong record because. You know, everyone was able to express themselves, and and we weren't being hemmed in by this thing about making a three and a half minute pop single sure. or anything like that. Yeah, a two minute pop song. Yeah, I mean, thankfully, I've forgotten a, a lot of the real everyday raw feelings of, of what it was like because I think it was quite fraught at times. But but I, I I think I think really from day one or two. We had some sort of ideas. There was other influences coming in. There was influences that, was, that were a lot looser. Mm. Things like the um... and we were committing to, to guitar sounds, like for instance, yeah. like you know, it wasn't the case of we called the guitars and we put the effects on when we mixed yeah, yeah, yeah. it. Graham was like, "This is the effect sound I've got. These are the pedals I've got for this song. And that's it." And that's yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, so we were committing. So mm. as soon as you push up the fader, that that's it. delay or that, yeah, that those, effect was on the guitar. The effect yeah. and how you're playing, you're playing the effect. So it doesn't really work to put it on afterwards. No, you're, no, you're playing off the always, effects, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's how I've always used effects. Really, it's not really possible to put them on afterwards unless it's a time based. You know, in this yeah, case, a bit of reverb or something. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's um, not really. I mean, really, my guitar playing is is effects playing. Yeah, yeah. Most that's yeah. part of my 
Yeah, I mean, if I'm just here alone with a guitar, I get quite worried because uh, I I went I kind of went to the guitar through via via pedals yeah, a lot yeah. of the time to excite me mm. and and didn't maybe regretfully really get stuck into learning the guitar like a lot of nerdy guitarists yeah. would have done. Mm. Well, I mean, there's a lot to be said about you know the balance of nerdy technique theory stuff through. To, I mean, speaking. Just for myself, I mean, I did a music degree, I'm a trained musician, you know, I know my Lydian mode from my harmonic minor and everything, but, I mean, I was always super jealous of people who could just play, and it doesn't sound like they're playing the notes from the right scale at the right time, you know? Mm. And what attracted, to me your, <laughs> what attracted me to your playing a lot was like, that's not... He, he didn't, that, that solo hasn't come from a, little, a set of black dots he's learned from a piece of paper. You know, and no. for me, and I've been in situations where a, a producer says, "Oh, play something," you know, just go crazy, and I, 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 and I can't do it. I can't break from that. Like this note's going to sound wrong, but I'm going to play it anyway. Yeah. But you, obviously, just like I, I suppose I was. You, you, it's it's odd, young and ignorant enough. I, I don't know to, for it to not bother me, and I'm I'm sure lots of guitar players, at early, blur shows ago. <laughs> Oh my God, uh, you know, maybe they weren't. Maybe they were doing that. It's like, wow, he's he's this he's free, oh. broken free from but, the boxes. But really, it's because I've done a lot of listening, and I suppose I knew what would sound good. And it's an interpretive game. Again, I'm interpreting the the lyrics and the music, and I'm feeling the groove, or I'm going against the groove that Alex is creating. And it's and it's and it's trying to be a lot. It's not an emulation, but um, it's it's um, bringing all those influences through. Whether it's George Harrison, you know, who I realise more and more I'm hugely influenced by, yeah. particularly with the, this yeah, kind of thirds, yeah, this yeah. kind of thing, you know, all the thirty stuff, um, which I'm really heavily into, and in a way, really heavily into fifties music. So, so my whole thing is is like George Harrison. The, the Beatles, you know, they they be on everything mm -hmm. from yeah. kind of classical all, all of to you know revolution, which is noisy guitars, to pop, sort of a, a sort of a garage beat music, um, to music hall, Lady Madonna kind of stuff. I mean, they just did everything, mm. like everything sonically, and you know, so and really overt psychedelic stuff. Although mm. that maybe isn't always my favourite. Stuff, but do you think they the they kind of follow the same pattern as you? I guess the first albums, straight lace, three minutes, do this, do that, be quiet, and then you know, rubber soul, revolver kicks in. It's suddenly yeah. echo chambers and double tracking, and then sudden, you know, they, when they quit touring, and then bang, they're committed yeah. to. Re and not yeah. being scared to kind of go down different yeah. genres, you yeah. know, kind of, uh, and, and that's that's the, they laid the blueprint, which I think most of the best bands that I've ever worked with. Uh, and if they're talented enough, they can do that themselves. They can try yeah. a bit of this and a bit of that, a bit of musical mm. influence, a bit of old rock and roll, rockabilly influence. The Smiths did it, mm. you know. You've only got to look, look at the Smiths albums, and it's a rockabilly influence on a few songs and a little bit of kind of, you know, kind of camp music hall influence. Something. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's mm. a bit, but you make it your own ultimately. Absolutely. But one of the things I always kind of said, and I've said this in many interviews about Graham's playing, is that. And I meant this as a compliment. Graham plays with his feet as much as, as with his hands, and I didn't mean <laughs> he's kind of. I know, yeah. But you know, but you, I mean, you were stamp on and off a pedal in time with the song to change between the beats, the sound that, that you're making from the guitar. You know, yeah, you can't yeah. do it all just with the, you know. And I love that, and mm. I think that's something that's really um, important. I mean, Oily Water is one of those songs, isn't it, where you kind of basically. Yeah what you're doing with the pedals coming on and off and all that kind of thing. I mean, I do it with the rats on that. Yeah. What is it? That do and and that's a rat going on and off like that. On, off, on, off, on, off until right. the switch yeah, just yeah. broke. <laughs> Halfway through <laughs> doing it, you know, I thought, why isn't, you know, and then having to get the AB switch that was a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a bit easier to, yeah. but uh, um, yeah, that was as much because I'm after sounds, I'm not yeah. particularly a guitar player in that way. 
and that's and kind sound of sound you know, maker, I guess, mm. more than anything. Sonic. I mean, using delays and changing the sound of everything. Obviously, that's very prevalent on on this blowout. Absolutely. Album. I mean, middle of the road's got that kind yeah. of close kind of delay thing, and then obviously the delay in time for the beginning of Beatles Bum. Yeah. So, yeah, Gray plays off of the off of the, the, the off of the the effect that he's using. Yeah. And I think that's really you know a powerful thing. Yeah. Because it it's the playing and that sound at that particular point being captured together that creates yeah. that. You're not going to come back to it and try and do it later. It's yeah. really important you capture it at that point. We didn't bother with On Your Own, did we? Because I, 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 it was a sort of a... I really like those guitar parts. Country Sad Ballad Man was another one where it was a, just a rough, really. Mm. Yeah. It, was, it was going down yeah. to create the structure, I suppose. Yeah, and then yeah. we just left it because it had yeah, something about it. To it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In the end of Con uh, Ballad Man... What's that effect when is it um whoop, 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 do, 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 that is it the vibrato or it's got in the la in the last bit of the song it goes round and round and round. Is it that? It's got a great is it like a, you got like a green vibrato pad, is it that? It's got the, I think it, oh, it's probably a couple of things. That's a great sound. I like think it. it's a vibrato. I Sounds think like it's a vibrato. Just a vibrato. Yeah. So yeah. going on that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was definitely the. The thing is, I can, I can, I could. I was very influenced by, you know, things like Pavement, and and Sonic Youth, and a lot of the sort of, the punk groups from America and things. But um, I could never be as serious. So it always had to. It ends because we're English, I suppose, um, and. So there was always something that was a, what's the word, um, unserious or a little bit of wit or... Frivolous. Yeah, you do yeah. something frivolous. You just say, uh, I'm getting a bit too serious now. I'm going to have to do something that's going to at least make me chuckle, if yeah. not loads of other people, because mm. it's getting too serious. Oh, my gosh, uh, whereas the Americans could be yeah, yeah, taking yeah. it absolutely, yeah, absolutely serious. Yeah. Mm. But the English find that a bit more difficult. Mm. So um, we mentioned song two in our last encounter. Two drum kits. Mm. Two like I, 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 I still remember. Is it two live drum face. kits? You had two like two drum kits set up like facing like and you just I think literally so. played at think, the I same time. I think we time. had them set up, set up at different ends of the room. For yeah, so we were pretty much opposite. Yeah, each opposite other. each other, different yeah. ends of the room. And then I think on that we just used a, a, a couple of room mics. It sounds really um, far away. Dave yeah. and Graham were on two different kits, just banging out a beat. And as I say, because I had this digital radar thing, it was very easy just for me to mark in and mark out. And I kind of, I heard them playing this rhythm, and I was recording it. And just we just had the room mics up, and I thought that sounds like an interesting thing. And then just like marked in and marked out, and hit loop ninety nine times. Whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. Know? And then the boys started playing over it. So, mm. did you set two drums up? Just to see what would happen, and that came out of it, or, or to do that song? No, because there's two drum kits set up for different sounding. Ah, oh, okay. Different sound oh, right, okay. It wasn't for like different, a, for oh, different right, songs. Right. Right? Oh, okay. So we had one kit at the noisier end of the room, like right. more kind of, not, it wasn't really a stone end, but it was more reflective, and then yeah. another end that was a bit more dead. Yeah. And then um, there was no thought put into it, it just literally had a room <laughs> mic in the middle. <laughs> You know, literally, seriously, I think it might have been two room mics then, whatever, but it was capturing just generally the ambience in the in the room, so I didn't have any close mics open at all. Yeah. And then recorded that, and then just looped it. And I can't remember exactly why we did that. I mean, because I don't think there's actually a song we actually did much in pre-production, did, did, but I don't, don't think we even worked through it much at all. I think it was just a little... No, I, I think it was that demo that was just acoustic that simple, with the... Yeah, yeah it was just a very thing. simple, you know... But I think we were like, mm, maybe we could try something with two kids, there's two kids set up. And you went, well, just go, go on, go out there and try something. And so we like, okay. recorded it, played it back, and then one thought, that sounds like interesting. Especially because it was, cause when something's looped, it takes on a certain yeah, yeah. It takes on a certain thing, like a groove. You do yeah. get this, if you get that inherent couple of bars, it feels right. And Dave was doing a straight ahead beat, and I was just going, boom, yeah, putting your stuff, stuff in the gaps, basically. Yeah. And I think there's two kicks going. And I'm clicking this yeah, rim on the of side it. of the side of the, the drums as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's all these little soft kind of soft beats in between the main beat, which yeah. creates this yeah, yeah, groove. Yeah, you know? yeah super And then Gray started playing these, and then it was all kind of. It felt good, so we thought great, and then thought okay, and now. 
let's everyone join in and it just naturally happened as soon mm. as Dave and, and Alex joined in on the chorus and Grace stepped on his pedal it suddenly like, woof yeah. and it was like hey this is fun and then a couple of times around it that's enough yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Let's get back to what we were doing earlier. Get back to a serious song, but I'm, I'm, I'm joking. It, no, we, no, we, exactly we, we knew yeah, it, yeah. it was no pressure on us. That yeah, was the yeah. thing. It was just really like chilled, and I, we did it in an afternoon, didn't we? It was, it was pretty quick. Yeah, it's always the way. Mm. And yeah, yeah. just I remember standing in this sort of area in that control room, which yeah. is was it a 57 or yeah. I don't know, just yeah. going doing the Something. lead vocal, yeah. and the whistle got replaced with a. And then again, our ears picked up because that's such a universal thing, you know. If someone just, it's like pure joy and relief kind yeah, of going. Yeah, yeah. So the, the lyrics were nonsense. The yoo is just like, well, it's nonsense, but it's universal. Yeah. And and, uh, and you know, bless him, he just he tried to write better lyrics for it, but every time he did it, it never really kind of had the same vibe. So you know, there's, there's a fair amount of guide vocal on that mm. finished vocal. Yeah. Was there any new vocal on it then? There was a little bit, yeah, a little ah, bit. Okay, because I wasn't sure. Yeah, there was a little bit of new vocal. We did, we did, we did new. I think, I think there was some, especially in the choruses. We got, we wanted it to be a little bit more powerful. So it was double tracking. So the original vocal was like the double track, and the new vocal was on top to give it yeah, a bit more. Okay. You know, yeah. it's very good. I mean, it's a very relaxed, throwaway vocal. You know. It's mm. That's why a lot, a lot of the nice things that you you don't think are going to stick around when you record it. But it's funny, you know, because we were stay because they're relaxed. And mm. like. do you remember halfway through that album, you played the gig in Ireland, in, in Dublin, in that uh, the, uh, the Irish football ground in Dublin, and and, oh, they, yeah, yeah. and they played the song. And everyone just looked at them and went, "What was that about?" <laughs> yeah, it's over before it began. Like two minutes in. I know. I mean, it, <laughs> it was funny actually. I forgot about that. Yeah, it's just like, and <laughs> where's the rest of the song? Yeah. But it was, uh, I mean, you never knew then it was going to no. be a take on such an important. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. America went hit bananas. Gonna, <laughs> they're going to love this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Tumbleweeds. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Chinese Bombs is also as raucous as that, isn't it? Yeah. That's even more so. That's more. That's, that's more so, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that, I mean, if you're talking about low fi it sounds. Not, I'm sure it wasn't. Was it intentionally grainy? Or? Yeah, yeah. I think that was actually one of the. That's one mix on the. I oh, know there was two mixes on the album I didn't do. I think that was. I think did you use the Mario really? Caldati mix? That was his surname, Mario. Oh right, really? Is it Mario? Was his surname the Beastie Boys guy? Cal, oh my gosh! I can't remember his surname. Caldato. No, Caldati or something. I can't Caldato. Remember. Forgive me if I got it wrong. Um, that's right. And I think there was, I think he did the mix on that because they wanted it even grungy. I did oh, okay. I did a kind of grungy mix with John John Smith, but they still wanted it even more. So I think I think he had a go at it. And, yeah. Uh, but um, but that was more of a struggle to get it right because it was a case of it was uh, you know like song two was a bit easier for some reason. Mm. Whereas I think because there's a bit more space in it. Whereas Chinese bombs is just like absolutely. It's, yeah. it's, but the playing on it is incredible. Yeah. I mean, the actual musicianship on it, you know, it's a real hard song to play, yeah. you know. It is hard because Both I'm I'm stars. saying I'm playing it the same as Damon because... Are you song two or Chinese Bombs? Chinese Bombs. Chinese Bombs. Yeah. yeah, because it's... But because Damon didn't know other chord shapes apart from an E shape, it's like... Leave that to Sorry, yeah, yeah it's like... Yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah. Yeah. and I could have made it easy. but it wasn't it didn't, didn't have, have that yeah, yeah that power because yeah. I loved the I you know we didn't mind being fuggish and artless at mm. all you know and live sometimes the tempo they play that's incredible yeah. I, just, I, I just thought Dave was going to explode you know? yeah yeah but, yeah that's quite good so um, 
another great the opening track is beat them isn't it with that amazing yeah that sounds like a broken that kind of broken record thing. i guess that's what that amazing and maybe that's what i was after yeah and also, sometimes if you come, to, you sometimes it's hard to know what is the downbeat on it. I, oh I, yeah, I can remember many yeah. times like putting up the multi-track and listening to it and thinking it's going to come in here, and it's like actually no, it's the next beat yeah. that comes in. It on. is confusing. Yeah, it happens like I'm live a few times too. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then we're coming wrong and realise it, and I had to sort of change. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's it's kind of a tricky one to try yeah, and change, yeah. and I change it a couple of times and still wouldn't get back with the with the. Repeats being in the right place mm. and all but it's that. One of the, it's one of the pinnacles, I think, in the Blur back catalogue. It that, is an amazing song, song, isn't it? It's a great song, great song. I guess you mentioned that Damon's lyrics were slightly less uh, character songs, more internally based. And right, just, yeah. I guess that was a very personal song for him, I suppose. Yeah, although I didn't pick up on the connotations of mm. what came evident. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. At the time, yeah, yeah, I was yeah. just thought it was just, uh, yeah. I was just, and I loved that, and then she, yeah, she yeah, yeah, I just thought the chorus again, yeah. it struck me as being be, very Beatlesque. Yes, that melody, you know, yeah, it could have been Lennon, it could have been Harrison, it was definitely had that kind of def Beatles influence. Yeah, absolutely. hence the Beatle Bum. I, I remember when I first wrote it down on the uh, on, when we were working on it, I, I wrote Beatle Bum with a B E A T, yeah, at, yeah, you know, because yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I thought it was a Beatlesque song, you know, but um, later on, obviously, realized it was about you know, it was Beatle double E, and yeah. um. And you know, obviously the other history to it, but yeah, I, I love still it. don't understand what a beetle, what, what beetle bum is. No, I don't know. But there is, but there is the the Spike Jones and the City Slickers race beetle bomb. There's that. That's oh, the only okay. thing I've heard oh, that. Yeah, you know, the race. You know, okay, the, I've never you know, heard the Spike Jones, the City Slickers. We used to listen to that a lot, <laughs> and slightly altered state, and um, giggle a lot, and um, <clears throat> the beetle bomb. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Know. But, that, yeah. So I mean, the, 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 the on your own has that. Was it which one is, is it? Middle of the road has that has the delay things in it. That amazing. Now on your own, you on your own's got, your own's got that real was quick it, delay it thing. Isn't it? Is it? Is it that? Because that I, oh, that's yeah. Yeah. I asked you about that before. You said you didn't. You thought it might have been added afterwards. I'm not. I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> That sounds like a didge, as they yeah, call yeah. them. Uh, it, uh, their friends call them a didge, don't they? Yeah. 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 You put that in. Did you put that in after? It's tremolo after. after. It's hard tremolo, isn't it? Yeah. Really got it in. It's very in time. It's so it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> Told off for we got told off for that from David Bowie, don't we? Yeah, it's a little bit because uh... I didn't know why. Because, um, is it Boys Keep Swinging? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a little bit influenced by oh, that. Okay. Imagine. It's just the, the kind of the way the vocal kind of it is a bit like that, I guess. It is, but, no, I did not know that. But yeah, yeah. that 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 took it, took it, took it. I'm sure that I, I don't know. <laughs> Great kind of textures and tones on yeah. there, you know. And the um, and the chorus there. I'm trying to ping a yeah, yeah. harmonic. Mm. It's cool though. Just try, just making life difficult, generally. 
for your live ease later on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hard, yeah. <laughs> really hard for the band and yourself. But uh, I mean, it's very fun making that record. Yeah. You know. It was. I, I what, what I really liked was was the was the fact that Damon was. It was coming a little bit more out of Damon's experience. Mm. And I remember one of my fondest memories is coming in on um, Look Inside America yeah. after he'd done the vocal. You know, coming yeah. in like four o'clock, he should have done the vocal. Whatever. And then going in to listen to the, the vocal, and I thought his lyrics were so lovely, and they um, summed up, really, summed up a lot of what touring in America was like for us, or him. And, but of course, what it was like for him as expressed through a song, which then you figure out, yeah. I re I, that's, that's kind it was of the one song would be caved in because the idea was not to have any string sections mm -hmm. or any brass sections or anything like that. You know, the idea was originally that this record was just going to be. That's right. A bit like you know, let it be was for the well, you know, they're all stripped down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, yeah, just yeah, the yeah. band, you just know, band, nothing yeah. else. Yeah. But then when we did look inside America, I thought it does need. And yes, we we put a harp on there as well. We got this classical that harp, harp, harp yeah. player in to come in. It was beautiful yeah. when she played, and it just seemed. So we just we had a little bit of fun with that, you know. Mm. It did need a little bit of kind of grown up input on it, as it were, you know, a classical musicianship, as it were. Yeah. And it's worked beautifully. I little think. tax man tone solo as well. That I love that. I mean, that was the thing to get the harp player to lull you into this, and then it goes, <laughs> and it's sort of little. Uh, Sounds like a. Yeah. I wasn't George always uh, awesome. feel comfortable about playing. Lead parts were always tricky for me. Um, to get them absolutely right. I suppose that's why being extremely trained or geeky about what to play on the guitar doesn't really, in the end, doesn't really matter because what it's just got to be appropriate and yeah. finding what is appropriate is not always easy. Like we talked about country house and yeah. how difficult that's so because it, what else do you do yeah, in that yeah. situation? I couldn't do a blues bass or a shred yeah. or a... They, there wasn't any shredding in those days, though. Yeah. It was called something else. But, I mean, um, it was rare for Graham to do a real solo on, on every single song. Yeah. I mean, Graham's never really. It's a bit like Johnny Marr. Johnny yeah. very rarely used to solo over everything. Yeah, you'd have um, 60 bars in the middle. Yeah, I mean, there'd be a little, perhaps a little break, but it wouldn't be what I would call no, you know, traditional, a, a kind of like yeah. really going for it type solo. But on this record, there was a bit more space for him to express himself. But bless him, Graham doesn't always think about what's best for me. Mm. You know, he will think about how it's going to suit the rest of the song too. And, that, yeah. and that's right. And that's the strength of good band members, that people do do that, you know. Yeah, think of the song first, yeah, not there. I guess if you're more, I guess the people who are sort of more technically accomplished, they they want, that's part of it for them, isn't it? This is the record, people are going to hear me play my 16th note. You know, if you haven't got that, if you're, you're just you know, honestly bringing music to the yeah, situation. I mean, if, if, yeah, if Metallica had written a song, so there'll be like a, yeah. a six-minute guitar solo yeah. probably on it. But, you know, it's like, but yeah. uh, we don't even give Graham the chance on that. It's like that's enough. Yeah, it's like you're in, you're out. You know. Also, yeah. features your song, one of your own songs you sang and played. You know. Um, Title, you're so great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you're so I great. Know, so that's, it did. that's the first. I love the melody on first yeah, song. I, first song I ever wrote. How come that happened to that album and not before? Or like, was it just literally? I never written. That was it. That's the first written. one you. I, I'm, you know, um, a side man. I felt like I did my job as the guitar player. Really. Mm. I mean, I suppose I tried to write songs when I was thirteen or fourteen, but they're always rubbish and you know, and ultra dramatic. And um, and too complicated. I think it takes a long time to um, learn that simplicity is best. And although it's not the simplest chord st structure in, in in the world, I, I you know it's um, and it was very simple. I recorded it on a dictaphone and played it to the boys and said, and because it was recorded on a dictaphone and it sounded like it had a vibe to it, I was like, well, I wanted to keep that kind of vibe. So although we're in this very plush. SSL studio, yeah. we tried to make it sound as home recorded as yeah. possible. I love the guitar solo, it's felt uh, for me that's pure George Harrison, that kind yeah, of yeah. solo on that. Yeah. I think that's really great, you know. Yeah, that's my idea, yeah, yeah. yeah, very nice. Um, but we, again, I loved it. I just loved the melody. As soon as I heard it, I said, Yeah, we should definitely record this. So, inspired by what I'd heard, you know, the dixophone mm. kind of thing, I thought, Let's keep it because yeah. yeah, I thought Graham's voice sounded great in that kind of context. And uh, and it was kind of like 
it didn't need everyone else on it, and it wasn't. You know, people might think, okay, I'm selling the song short, making that decision, but it wasn't. It was like it. It had a. It's only so personal, you know, and 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 I just wanted Graham to have that moment mm. for himself, and I think that's its strength on that mm. record. Because there, are there drums and bass on that track? No, are there? Just, no, there's nothing on it. It was yeah. a funny decision. Really. I mean, no one else was. I don't think really in the studio. I mean, did it? I mean, it didn't take long to to make it that song. I have done it live when I've brought drums in at the end and elongated the sort of riff at the end and yeah. it sort of it just sort of sounds kind of like it sort of goes into grunge territory a bit. But um Yeah, I, I, I yeah. I suppose that's why it was called my album for a while because I had that and there was obviously a bit more of an American influence to it. There was a bit more of a, a tortoise. Tortoise was a group that was in, 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 into which were these elongated instrumentals that were uh, very interesting and, and quite s sort of um, you know they weren't just sort of vibey jams. They were mm. quite thought out. Yeah. And, and, and I was really into that tortoise album. Mom all the fish on the front. It's got a long title. I can't remember it now. And I think that's where the Essex Dogs kind of thing came in as well. Sort of um, an elongated sort of jam, and then um, yeah. But um, looking inside America was lovely. But anyway, yeah, that was one of my my highlights. And although it's kind of a bit more of a traditional sort of song, um, because it came from a more personal place, I I, I like I liked that. Mm. Yeah. Another track I really like on the on the album is "Death of a Party," yeah. which is a song that the guys had had around for quite a long time I think it had never quite fitted in before you know um, had you recorded it completely in a different way before I can't remember, I can't remember. but I remember apparently apparently it comes from modern life is rubbish times um, so it was kind of a song and I really enjoyed I, been, yeah. I really enjoyed working on that because this one this was um, again sonically it was <laughs> And I remember saying to Greg, can you play the same as the bass line? And, uh, and that really worked. It kind of gives you that kind of that reggae thing. You know? Yeah, yeah. You get a guitar and the bass stuff. You know? It's great, isn't it? Mm. It's really. Yeah. Is that two sounds blended, or is it just one? I think organ? it's that little cheap organ that you know, the little Hammond organ thing that he got. You know, the little Lot One Hundred One. Oh, yeah, yeah, Lot One Hundred One. I think it could have been that. Um, or One Hundred Five. One Hundred Five. Was it One Hundred Five? I think. Yeah. But anyway, uh, I enjoyed that one because that, again, that was a chance for me and John to kind of. We did kind of add a bit more effects on the mix yeah, on that yeah. one, the dub kind of, you know, mm -hmm. reverbs and sp splashes and things, and that, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, so, what, 97, I suppose, isn't it? So, 96, I think it was. 96, I think it was making making it in 96, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So, that was pre plugins, wasn't it? That's pretty much. Pre was yeah. it all just outboard gear then? Or? All outboard gear, no yeah. plugins at all. Because, I mean, the radar system that I was recording on was purely a recording system. There was no space for plugins. So, any effects that were added later on were done at the mixing stage with proper, you know, like uh, EMT lexicons, like reverb or lexicons yeah. or whatever. Yeah, okay. yeah. 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 So, back in those days, how did you get that? How and mixed to you... tape as well, mixed to half inch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how did you, when you got that kind of gritty kind of use the phrase to get that, that, that kind of lo-fi sound we're used to using like digital kind of bit crushes or whatever i mean how, how did how was that created with on tape without those kind of digital effects how did you do that um we did distort things i mean i mean gray obviously anything that he was doing distortion wise would be done nine times out of ten through pedals mm. that he was using anyway but the drums on that death of party the whole thing sounds like yeah. it's like it was put, done put, put through Either sometimes put back through a pedal, oh, okay. uh, or uh, indeed just cranked up through just something. literally overloading yeah, no analog systems, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, yeah brilliant. Uh, you know, and things like that. Um, again, John was great at that kind of thing. He always liked to to be kind of pushed into the kind of realms of compression and distortion mm. and stuff, and and so. Yeah, we'd often kind of record something. It might sometimes just be using the room mic rather than the close mics, and again, you know, really mashing it up a little bit. But it would be done through 
proper kind of um, outboard equipment yeah. or, or, or the mic amps on the desk perhaps mm. and um, used where appropriate hmm. so you if it if you're engineering producing and mixing if you're doing all three of those jobs well, I don't, Do you... regard, I don't regard them as separate jobs. I mean, like for me, because I came into production from the engineering side, um, I regarded it as being the same thing mm. as Martin Hannett or Martin Russian or Steve Lillywhite or John Leckie. It was like, that's what you do. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. You're, yeah. The thing you're bringing to the party is your skill at the, first of all, capturing it, yeah. you know, recording it. Obviously, then also the man management thing, getting the best performances out of people. And then the mixing thing, I regarded that as part of the production. Mm. I kind of, I got a bit sick of kind of. I've had people say to me recently, "Oh, I didn't know you mixed your own stuff." As if because you're a <laughs> producer, you don't mix it. And I'm like, well, I do because I regard that as part. It's the final part of the production. Yeah. You don't get a film director kind of. Oh, well, no, he might not be the final editor on the film. You don't kind of get him walking away at the editing stage and say, "I'm not involved anymore." Yeah. For me, the mixing is, it's it's an important part of it, and I always kind of argue that. Give me a chance to at least mix it once before you get someone else in to yeah. mix it. I'm not into this idea of take it there and then give it to someone else to yeah. mix. I don't like that idea. I've never understood that either. And if you're like for you, if you're really hands on, if Greg, you know, Greg comes in with an idea and it's on a pad, you know, and you think, okay, well, it's the like best way to record that is going to be like this. You it's, engineer it. It's like your dad working yeah. on the police stuff. Yeah. And you can imagine if the police had made those records and then it was given to Bob Clearmount to mix, it wouldn't sound the same. It would sound very different yeah but because your dad was there working with them all the way through from the very beginning to the very final stage yeah. that is the production it's not yeah. you can't break it up into yeah. di different bits that is it mm. and i think that's really important yeah and and so yeah. i couldn't imagine do i couldn't imagine working with a band getting this you know engineering getting the sounds onto tape and, work, and then like you say okay thanks yeah, uh, unfortunately, it's, a, it's happened. It seems to become like you're getting. It, yeah, people seem to have been mixing more, and engineers. There are some yeah. people that are mixers yeah. these yeah. days, and it does. I, I can sort of understand it in in a sense that if someone is very ill experienced and they're. Yeah. Well, this is the thing now. And they're like, oh my god, yeah, yeah. What, what what done? Done? Well, this yeah. is what it now. I mean, I, I, yeah. I mean, for a lot of mixers, you know, they're, they're, they're coming in as doctors at the end to try and fix because yeah. a lot of people now are just doing their own thing and you know using you know logic or garage band or whatever and recording it and thinking okay someone else can sort that out later yeah. and you know and I, I mean I've got a very good friend Chenzo who's you know a good mixer and he says some of the, some of the things he gets to mix you know you can tell it, the difference between that and the stuff that, that I might give him to yeah, mix sure. or something is very it's like chalk and cheese you mix, know like, like rescuing almost your yeah. job is to rescue yeah. these and sessions. I'm not you know I'm not demeaning what mixers do I'm thinking no. you know, there is a place where you know obviously you know, they do, are needed and they have to come in and but I don't I, I, I don't like personally I don't like to subdivide like mixing and production mm. I think they very much uh, intertwine. Well, if I think it's someone like you, then you're you're the full thing. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's a kind of an old school thing, isn't it? Where where someone has had the experience and has the knowledge to take it from pre-production right the way through. Yeah. To seeing them play the album live. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the yeah. end of yeah. making yeah. a record is seeing it played live and being at the party and yeah, great. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I suppose maybe they're a bit more few and far between. And I guess what we were talking about before you got here, Greg, with all, all these amazing studios that were closed down, I think yeah. that as an industry pathway, like the classic T-boy, mm -hmm. engineers, assistant engineer, bands work out that, oh, he's got a good few ideas, you end up producing, and then, you know, it. I think maybe with the death of the recording studio, is the death of the, that old school talent, that whole career yeah. as a sound it's sad is kind of gone. There's so many great people that I've met who've recorded with me over the years and they've had to give up. You know, they're now fitting kitchens yeah. because they just don't make any money as being a recording engineer. It's a sad thing. People seem to kind of, you know, there was a time back in the 60s and 70s if you were a really good hot recording engineer, you, you were used and utilised. Yeah. It's no longer the case. Everyone, everyone thinks that they can do it themselves, and you know, and and 
it's been it's been demystified the the act of recording. Mm. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and it's a shame, really. I mean, I mean, Kate, I'm, I think it's wonderful. There's freedom there for everyone to be creative and do their own thing, and, and that's great. But at the same time, what they've also done, they've also killed the recording industry, uh, or a big part of it. And mm. there are a lot of talented people who just can't make make it make ends meet anymore. Yeah, working in recording studios. Um, you know, it's, I always often think that the people running all these festivals and so on, they benefit from people making good records because if people make a good record, people want to go see that band making their performances at these festivals. So they fill their pockets, but it doesn't work the other way around at the moment. You know, people are going to the festivals, but they're not really investing much money in buying recorded music. So the recorded music end of the industry is really taking a kind of a kick to the midriff from which it's never really recovered. Do you think there could ever be a way back do you think the value uh, vinyl sales are, are peaking out yeah I've, they're, they're, they're picked up but do you think it might uh, do you think this this might just go round and people will value albums and value the sound the, like cause we, we were talking earlier about how records drums and bass and it, it doesn't sound, even though they're played by people, it doesn't sound like it. By the time I've heard the record, the drums just sound like BFD. The drum, you know. Do you think that people will come round, or is that it? Do you think that's it? We, we, it's a linear thing, and, we, and we, it's, it's evolved to this, and it's going to carry on. Or do you, will nostalgia and, and would, do you think? I would like to think that it would come round, and I think it's good that you know people are kind of checking out vinyl again. But there's a couple of things you've got to consider. People get excited, okay, vinyl's gone up 20% on record sales day or every record um, day. Uh, or Germany, it's gone up 100% since last year. But it was so flat on the ground that 100% or you know, or 20% on that is not mm. very much. It's still nowhere back to where it was before the internet came in. And I think also is that for all that hope, and also the, uh, in the record vinyl sales are great at the moment in the shops, you know, there's more shops selling vinyl but a lot of it is second hand vinyl yeah so there's no royalties going out anymore no. to the artists being uh, who made those records in the first place right yeah. it's, it's the only people making money out of it the people who take their records in the shop and sell them and in the shop and it puts you know when it, they put up their price and sell it for more uh, and i'd like to think it's getting better but when i look at the charts and mm. see what's in the charts it's like that doesn't show yeah. you know um that it is healthy and I think they've got to look at the way how they make the charts because I mean there was a time when I worked with Graham and we'd make a record and we'd go be excited we might you know wonder what it's going to get to in the chart and it's not just Graham any artist yeah, I of course. With. and you yeah. think okay great you know I mean like you know 10 years ago from now I was having top 10 hits with the Kaiser Chiefs no one get a sniff these days you know what I mean it just mm. it just it's, it's changed it, uh, people just aren't you know you're making a record and you think okay it's coming out but not, not going to see it in the chart. Not going to see. You're not going to see anyone react to it. You no, know? Not. there's so many charts. I mean, when I was a kid, there was the album chart and the singles chart. The yeah. end. Sun, you know, Sunday afternoon, you'd sit there, Radio One, and you know, take them all off, pushing forward. You know, well, no, and that it's... was. And Top of the Pops was the only TV show. And, but now it's just saturation point, isn't it? I mean, there's. Yeah, it's a shame. You know. I and mean, people say, well, there's freedom now in the internet because, you know, we haven't got, you know, we don't have to worry about getting on the radio or on playlist and everything. But they're, ki they're kidding themselves because basically all, it, all people are worried about now is getting on a Spotify playlist. You know, if, like, if your music doesn't fit into a certain genre to get on that Spotify playlist, at the, at, you know, that they make up at the end of the week, you're not going to get any exposure. Because mm. people are lazy. They just put Spotify and have it in the background. Yeah. It's the same as they used to have Radio 1 on in the background. Yeah. So it has, nothing's really changed in that respect. You know, that's a, bit, that's a bit. I know it's a bit negative to think of it like that, but you know, as well, it's, you know, a, fact, it's, yeah, but it's a fact. Though. Yeah, the facts. It's funny. It's funny these days because of of, of the absolute obsession now with um, with analog gear and, and, and everything else, else like that, and how available things are, and all oh, these little companies, companies. Um, boutique companies. Yeah, everyone is making stuff, you know, and it's yeah. easy to get cheap stuff or mega expensive stuff and stuff that sounded better than anything really has ever sounded and um, and yet these these the, the, the studios are sort of dying away it's sort of um, yeah I, I miss studios I'm, I'm still the sort of person that 
although I have bits at home, I still actually like the studio. I still I Going still to a actually place like work. Yeah, yeah, and I still like nosing around in the studio, looking at this dusty thing and that dusty thing, and oh, what does that do? You know, I, I can't at home pick up one of my things and. You know, the, the, it's all a bit familiar. So when you're in, in a big live room in a studio, you can nose around and hit a few, few things with a drumstick, and um, and you can have a and you have a room, you know, and you can have a room to put your drums in, and you can have a room for an amp in a mic at the other side of the room, and and um, I like the sort of clocking in aspect and the you know I like the, the timeline of the studio day. I like the sound of tape machines rewinding, but. That's, yeah. I always love that sound. I used to sound like you would push stop on a track and the reverb tails would go and... I mean, well, one of the greatest like things about being in this industry in is going in at the beginning of the day, and there's, it used to be you had a blank bit of tape, but now it's a blank hard drive. And then you work, you know, hopefully with, you know, and it's, and it's a, with, with another talented person or people and you make and you create something at the end of the day as Graham said you get that sense of satisfaction and you leave the studio at the end of the day mm. and you listen back and think did we did well there we've created something there and that's what I love about the industry is that once you've created something you know you could get go out here and get in October by a bus or something but you've created something you've done something you've made a mark you've you know you, this thing will always be there It'd always be there. That record will always be there. Even 50 years from now, when mm. we're all gone, you know what I mean. That record still exists, and someone will better put it on and yeah. listen to it. And so that is the real upside to it. So I don't want to be too negative about things because I actually I'm very proud of what we've done in the past mm. and what we've created. And there is a real buzz to it when you when you do when you do leave the studio after a good day and you, f you feel like you've done some good work. You can't you can't be, you can't beat that. Yeah. I've just realised that it's, it's that um half park life and half. No, that's 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 looking inside a man. Good oh. morning, lethargy, drink Pepsi. Isn't it? Is it Free Bird by Linus? <laughs> if I leave you tomorrow, hey, fresh producer, should I should turn the camera off? <laughs> no, instead of A minor at the end of the day, it's flipping. Shh, that's that's amazing. The cameras are rolling. Good morning, if I leave you tomorrow. <laughs> For someone who says you yeah. didn't study, and this is what I didn't understand last time, for someone who says you didn't study the guitar, how do you go from boomer shang langa cowboy chords to going zoodle ding ga ding zoop -a -ba -doo. I mean, that no. couldn't have all been trial and error, could it? There was no YouTube. But it, do you know what did I had? Did you ever um, sit down? I had like... album. I had the Beatles complete, but I had, you know, and then I'd get the jam set in Suns. You get these little books yeah. with the songs in, in chord boxes. <laughs> That's why I learned. I just yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I had to just. Well, I started one, yeah. to work out. Well, I was thirteen. You know, it was. It was. It takes a while, but then you, then you go. You're like, oh, that's a bit like Eric Clapton. And then you listen to loads of. Cream, and then and you listen to Hendrix, and yeah. you just try to, so you to literally play and just apply tried, that to everything. You, tried you moving can. your hands up the neck, and did you like see video? I, I don't, I don't. Get, I, I think don't with, I think it's just something that is there from loving music, and I think anybody who really loves music and listens to loads of music, they get crammed full of ideas, 
and um, I think that's it's, it's it's sort of it's like what I say you have this I have this store of riffs or ideas and and it's like that I don't know these are just mannerisms and it's that it's to do with developing a touch everyone mm. gets everyone gets that and that's why no two guitar players mm. really ever play the same and it, and and that's why guitar players can make any instrument so, don't yeah, they? You yeah, hear yeah. that thing? God, he he picked up this cheap ass guitar and it sounded like him. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's nothing it's really to do yeah. with the guitar. Um, I mean, yeah. some, so many times the over the years, I've had people say to me, "Can you make it sound a bit like Graham or a bit like Johnny Marr?" And I say, "No, I can't, because right. I can give you exactly the same guitar, exactly the same amp. Yeah. But it comes the touch, the sound comes from the guy's fingers. Mm. It really does. And these things just develop. They they did with me. Of course, you know, um, if if you go back to <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like it's a bit sort of simple, but then you get. Mm. I know you've got to sort of turn yourself on with what you're with your playing and what is appropriate. And 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 I got you know all these sort of things. These were all just things because my fingers didn't want to stay there. Yeah. And, and it's almost because, like I used to say about um, Ringo, doesn't do an awful lot of fills, but Paul McCartney does them on the yeah, on the, the bass. bass. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Like in rain. <laughs> But actually, Ringo is doing a fill at the same time. But he does the fills, and yeah. I suppose I was doing fills. Yeah. As, as well, they, they are called fills, aren't they? But, but yeah. they're not drum fills. That's what I love fills. about Graham. Is that it, it could be a really simple chord sequence, but he would do something in between the, each chord that will make it sound yeah. like a million dollars. Yeah. Because like, what was that? Yeah, yeah. A little inflection, a little bit of a bend or something. Yeah. It just makes it come alive. And that, and like the, the part life. The chorus of it, the G, the G you know, E minor thing, that that, that that the riff at the end, do 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 do. do. Oh, that, yeah, well, it's a lot of contrariness in my. That's just trying to be a bit jazz. Jazz, yeah. jazz isn't it? Really? Yeah. Because yeah. that's pretty. That's quite, quite, quite an intellectual chord. That's quite. That's quite. Well, a, this is one of my like favourite a... chords. Yeah. yeah, you can. See, I'm rubbish at doing it, but it's. I mean, that's kind of like. Is it? Is it Dominion? It's kind of like. It's kind of like that. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what that is, don't you? That's the chord at the end of the. Yeah. Just before it goes yeah, back into yeah, the. Yeah, yeah. And I guess I knew all those chords from covering all the songs that I used to they, cover yeah, in the early yeah, days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those kind yeah. of diminished I mean, chords this, and that's jazz, a lovely augmented yeah. thing. And it was the beat. That's why the Beatles is such a massive mm -hmm. education because yeah. they used chords properly diminished. So. <laughs> And um, they, you know, like augmented and the difference between a minor, normal minor, and a minor seventh, and yeah. and then going from major to minor, yeah, which is really, but then going from minor to majors, uh, you know, it, it, it's sort of that. That's that chord sequence of minor. <laughs> Just how I mean, if that if they were just normal chords, if that D wasn't a seventh, it just wouldn't have that pull. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and there's that. <laughs> there's just things about seventh chord. I love seventh. seventh yeah, and there's just something that happens. That. Especially when you did a finger up, adding the seventh on the up the octave as well. What he just did there. That's yeah. That's just you've got to have that one. All those little tricks. I mean, I, even I used it when I was kind yeah. of working with Morrissey. I mean, if you listen to the beginning of every day, it's like Sunday. It's C, C7. Do it. C. But that'd be simple though. But it, yeah. it's, I mean, yeah. even in my thuggish way. But it's just, it says. It was, it was yeah, just, yeah. but I just learned that. Yeah. Oh, oh well, that's C seventh chord, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, and again the major to minor thing. I mean, I used it on um, 
uh, Late Night Maudling Street. So Late Night Maudling I love Street this record. is sort about by the way. I listen to this record every day for months. So that's a G major. Yeah. So. And then the verse is E minor. Minor still. Now go back to a major but sus. Yeah, it's lovely now. Yeah. And E to C is always beautiful. Well. And that's it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was my little nod to that again. All those little tricks and things I learned from the Beatles songbook. You know what I mean? All those kind of major to minor things. Yeah. And, and I just love that sus form. Beautifully there, Where else, though, it's been E minor. So they shouldn't really go together at all, yeah, but yeah, it yeah. kind of worked. Yeah, it yeah. Was, so. But yeah, I mean, and, you know, I'm watching, I'm watching Graham play over the years. Mark I think, how does he do that? And I've noticed he's just done a little thing with his little finger that changes the chord. And, and it's like Johnny did as well. You know, you just think that, that one little thing, that one little change in the chord makes it open, suddenly open up, you know. And sometimes it's to do with visually, or, or it's a sort of a thing like. Um, <laughs> It's just a thing of, oh, you know, um, I'll go, I'll go up to that sick, and I'll put my little finger there and do the same. Yeah, and yeah. then it's, it's really just, I wonder what that, and it's a simple thing. It's not, yeah, it's not intellectual. At Apparently, all. Jimmy Page kind of almost said visual, that. You know, like move that. the move, the, move your fingers of a of a familiar shape onto quite. a different set of strings or something. That, apparently, mm. a lot of his stuff he got just by doing that. I wonder what happens if you, you know. Yeah. But put a D shape down a set of strings, you get a diminished sound or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. A lot of his um, acoustic -y stuff he said he did that with. Yeah. I mean, when you did, um, the other thing is that sometimes also, it's not just adding notes, it's actually sometimes taking notes out. Like, I think I remember yeah, you saying in the past that like, when you did Freaking Out, you basically, all the chords are kind of slightly incomplete and either major or minor, is that right? You were just playing in Freaking yeah, Out? Yeah, that, that. Yeah, well, that's that that chord that I was always that I used that a lot. And, and um, there's a funny blur B side. Yeah. yeah. It's a th third less E, isn't it? Yeah. Thirdless is what I mean because it's just that it, yeah. it makes it so it kind of is like is it major or minor? You're not sure, you know. It has and that, that comes thing. from birthday, um, <laughs> the Beatles' birthday, right? In um, the Beatles' complete, it's it's the, oh, we're going to a party, party. Yeah, I always thought, wow, that sounds brilliant. And it said, E, no third. And I thought, what? Oh, hang on. So, do I just what do I do with it, or is it just a power chord? It's just like. But then I read that you could do it E like that. Then you could hit all the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, if it's it's just one up from the E shape. And that's London Love, isn't it? I just, instead of going, it's like, it's kind of just making the chord. That's a great move. Oh around. man, that's a great song. One thing that's always fascinated me with all the amazing records is, and when you list. When you got through most of the recording of Part Life, and in the old days you got all the tapes in the boxes, you know, on the shelf, you look at the time. <coughs> did you think at the time, before it came out, fuck, this is going to be really the one? 
more than the other ones. Even though I probably had more idea than me did. I, I, I knew we'd known a good piece of work. I knew, I knew the, the guys were on a, an, an ascent. Yeah. It was evident after I'd saw them play at Reading after they'd done Modern Life is Rubbish. Yeah. Because Modern Life is Rubbish had come out and, and the, the general press seemed to have been kind of lukewarmish, I would say, at, uh, at the time. But when yeah. I saw the guys play at Reading in the tent and the reaction to the, from the crowd was nuts. You remember that gig, don't you? Yeah, that was the... And I remember thinking, there's something yeah. going on here. There's something really happening. And then we went into the studio to start work on Park Life really quickly after Modern Life is Rubbish. Um, and I think we, we went in and we recorded Jubilee, Park Life itself, and some other tracks. And it was kind of good, but, you know, it, but it was the next session we did where we kind of really got, really kind of got the kind of, uh, got the flow, you know. And it was, I remember once we'd done Girls and Boys, because it was so different to anything else that we had done up to that point. But I remember saying to Damon, I think this is going to be a top five hit. Because again, it was so universal, the girls were like boys, you yeah, know, yeah. I mean, it was just like, a, I mean, we had a lot of fun with it, you know, we weren't too serious with it, we just kind of, just lashed at it, just yeah. went for it. And, because by this time we were thoroughly, well I was thoroughly sick of Park Life itself, the track. Just, we were like struggling with it. was a struggle, it. wasn't it? And we just left it, you know, we just kind of like, and so there was, you know, I think the pressure was, part that's got to be a single. So we kind of, we, we fussed about it too much and we just couldn't get it right. One of the things was we weren't happy with the vocal performance. It wasn't Damon's fault, it's just that it didn't have something about it. And secondly, Dave's drums were too, we made him play too, too much of a click. It was too kind of... It was kind of more on a toms in the verse, wasn't it? Yeah, with it was a just, a didn't, it felt very, it. it's a very hard song to get right actually, part like, because that, that beat, that groove, if if you get it, if you do it too fast, it doesn't have that kind of jaunty. Jaunt. Yeah. And if you do it too slow, it, t it turns into uh, like a quagmire. <laughs> yeah. It turns into a muddy quagmire. Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. It's like you know, it's really trying. Anyway, we basically we'd gone up a kind of the wrong river with it. Mm. Kind of like sick of it. Put it to one side and we concentrated on other songs. We had a lot of fun with it. And then the idea was originally. Phil was going to come in and do a poem that Damon was going to write for the song called The Debt Collector. But Damon never, never kind of got around to writing the poem and finishing it to his satisfaction. And so it was like, well, I remember sitting around with Graham and Damon, we're sitting in the, the kind of uh, Maison Rouge studios, and it was like, well, we're going to approach the guy, why don't we let him have a go at doing, you know, mm. part life, see if it kind of gets it over. And as soon as he did that, it was like great, and then we got Dave back in to re-record the drums in a much looser fashion, and it all suddenly kind of came back together again. Because there, there was a risk at one time, it wasn't going to make it. come out, yeah. Yeah, because we were, you know, we'd kind of gone around the house. It would have been alright if it hadn't, though, I think. <laughs> you know, I hear part life all the time. Yeah, yeah. On adverts and everywhere, it's really, it's really crazy. Yeah. But yeah, to get back to your earlier question, we did know. I think once we finished the whole body of work, we knew we'd done yeah, something, something special. pretty special. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it, it was sort of like, um, I, I, I remember in an interview saying that there's sort of like stations in a, on, a, on, on a train where there are yeah. some intermediates, like Modern Life is Rubbish was a smaller station that was definitely on its way to a main mm. station, which yeah. was going to be Park Life. And that was where all of these things that we were sort of, Coming out of what it, the late eighties, really, and the early nineties, and and the thing of um, indie dance crossover and Manchester and all these other things, and um, was starting to just die down. Yeah, and, you know, uh, um, we we kind of stepping stoned a little bit on on the sort of on the, I suppose the dance. There's no other way, and things like that. Mm. We're a little bit in that, but there was elements within that that were slightly more. Just a bit better, really. Yeah. And, and and had really a little bit of sort of a hint of some psychedelic stuff and, mm. and all the rest of it, which was going to become very, very popular. Yeah. But we'd had, you know... I mean, it was it was odd that before that, the pop scene sort of blasted through and so sort of people just didn't particularly bother, mm. bother with it. Because... Um, that was a little bit of a sign of things to come to. Yeah, and sure. And so we, when when we could just start from scratch almost, without even wear our influences more on our sleeves and not particularly have to get our foot in the door by using a little bit of 
indie dance mm. vibe. I guess that's that's when that's that was sort of modern life was rubbish. But you know, it's surprising because a lot of the songs though from that period, you know, like the the, Man, the Manchester and the yeah, dancing, yeah. Baggies, they haven't really aged that well. But no, there's no. no other way; has it aged really well? I mean, I'm not saying I know it's a bit kind of big headed to say it, you know, because we, we made it. Yeah. Uh, but I actually think when I hear it on radio, it yes, still it, sounds. Yeah. Pretty, I think it still sounds fresh. Doesn't you know? sound. Yeah. I think because it's not overt. The kind of really overt mm. the use of any. And it's a killer riff. I mean, you're loop, a yeah, yeah, looping riff. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. Not overt. yeah. And the, yeah, that riff you got, you only got to hear that down, and, it, and people just go, "Whoa!" You know, yes, you can see it. Yeah. It's just, it does have a certain. I hate the word riff. zeitgeist about it. It does, it does put you. It's never in, in them place. top ten riffs in the whole world. Top lists. ten, Graham. That's a bit of a push. Twenty. Fifty. <laughs> <laughs> it's never in them. Li- is there riffs? Top but, ten I mean, riffs. There, there is many riffs. Yeah, there is many riffs, but it does have that thing. It's sort of um, it has his little wit about it as well. Mm. It's a little bit of a obviously this is a, this is a little bit of fun and, yeah. it's, and it's catchy and, and it's got that age old thing in the production. If you're not sure what to do, just stop the drums for a second and then bring it back in again, and it picks everyone back. <laughs> it picks them back. It picks everything back up. And that is a whole other thing of lo- <laughs> loving things like. Bass and guitar do in unison, yeah, which, yeah. which, which I love from bands like The Meters and stuff like that. Yeah. And also the that kind of harmony as well between bass and guitar. Oh yeah. Which so, was all yeah. sort of metersy kind of stuff. It's all rhythm mm. and blues. Yeah. Getting a bit of that. So there's all sorts of of, of influences and. That, and, and especially in my playing, there's all sorts of influences. That's why I used to get a little bit... And if you consider how young they were, and it was only their second ever single, Crazy, isn't it? it shows you, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's good musicianship there, right from the very beginning. That's what used to annoy me, really, if people would pigeonhole hole as really, uh, pigeonhole me as the kind of mad sort of lo-fi loving, punky mm. one. Yeah. But it's so obvious to anybody, really, who, who loves music, that there's an awful lot more going on in the play. Yeah. And with the, with the rest of the group, and Alex is very underrated, as we were talking about, yeah. Andy, weren't we? And, um, you know, hugely underrated, come, it's come up with some incredible bass lines. Yeah, absolutely. Don't play so many fucking notes! That's <laughs> what David Balf used to say, <laughs> to try and get him to not play around. <laughs> but he would, he, I mean, some of his busy, I mean, there's a song called Down, which is really busy. Was it Down? <laughs> He's like that, all the way, you know, and um, but he could be very, very busy, and sometimes it work, sometimes mm. have to yeah. take a few of those notes out. Uh, but, but you know, <laughs> again, it's it, it's him playing with you that makes it sound like Blur, though. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah and even with the the last Blur album, there might be some idea of how the ba- you know, the bass part might be. But Alex would come in and Alex be Alex. And, you know, he's like me, he's got, he doesn't like his fingers to stay still. Much. Yeah. Like, and th- th- all those little... Beautiful... I remember him actually sitting right there playing yeah. bass, so he came in and you and I looked at each other and he did, he did something, we both smiled and went, that is just so typically and he, Alex. Because you know, he, he and won't made... sit on a groove for long, he'll have to do something daft and go, and sometimes it's like, whoa, and he'll go, Ugh. and other times it's, mostly actually, he's, he, does, he does some great little lick. Yeah. Yeah. Mm that's just come out of nowhere and I think shocks everyone including him you know <laughs> and yeah because he's, he just he loves it yeah. 